<clears throat> Question. Well, based upon that information, though, what did you learn in terms of Julie Jensen's condition on Wednesday, December 6th? Okay, well, what information did you rely upon in coming to con any conclusions regarding Julie Jensen's condition on Wednesday, July, uh, December 1st, 1998? There was um, a conversation between... Um, I'm sorry, I, I should say Wednesday, December 2nd, 1998. That's up. Uh, there was a conversation between... Um, the defendant and um, Julie Jensen's brother, in which he described her condition. And what did he say about her condition? Now I forget when, between them. On what did what did Mark Jensen say to Paul Griffin Sorry. regarding Julie Jensen's condition on Wednesday, December second, the day before she died? Okay, um, he said that, and I'm paraphrasing, um, something that she was sleepy and, and groggy and she could barely get out of bed and I think he said he didn't even remember her getting out of bed um, since the morning um, and that's about it. Do you recall him saying anything about her puking? Yes. What did he say about her puking if you can recall? He, he said she couldn't keep anything down. No. Does that influence your conclusion concerning whether there was likely more, one or more uh, doses of ethylene glycol administered to Julie Jensen? It supports the conclusion that there were more than one, that there was more than one dose. Now, getting back to this issue of asphyxiation, um, did you ever see This photograph that has been marked as Exhibit S8, which portrays Julie's face at the crime scene. Let me put it like this. Yes. And you notice something unusual about the nose and the mouth of Julie Jensen at that point? Yes. Um, I think it's clear to see that they're kind of shoved off to the right side. And is that consistent or inconsistent with the manner and death as described by Aaron Dillard? It would be consistent. <clears throat> now, doctor, you are aware that in addition to the toxicological tests that were performed by uh, Dr. Long's laboratory, in this case, there were the, that these tox that these substances, the the blood, the gastric contents, and the urine were shipped out to a variety of defense experts. Correct? I know of objection. She answer. She knows. If she knows, she can answer. I you know, know of your personal knowledge. Yes, I know of at least two. Okay, tell us uh, now. Did the anything from these? Defense expert labs, did they alter your opinion in any way concerning the cause or manner of death of Julie Jensen? No. Did they alter your estimation of the accuracy of any of the findings of Dr. Long in any way? No. Well, did they refute or corroborate, or were they, were they not even relevant to Dr. Long's findings? I, I, I object. That wasn't the... What's the objection? It wasn't the purpose of the, of, of, of the testing. What difference to make what the purpose is? If she knows the result, uh, it's, uh, she's a, a witness. She's not, well, I'm not going to say any more. The objection's overruled. So t the results that you saw from these defense expert labs, do they uh, support, refute, or are they irrelevant to Dr. Long's findings? They support them. Can you explain which ones support them and how? There was, um the, particularly the test on the blood for ethylene glycol. Um, Dr. Long's laboratory, if I remember the number correctly, found 55 micrograms per milliliter of ethylene glycol in Mrs. Jensen's blood. The lab um, from the University of Kentucky found approximately 40 um, in the same units, micrograms per milliliter. And I would say that those numbers correspond pretty well. They corroborate each other? Yes. 
And there was another lab result that you'd seen? Um, yes. Okay, what was the other lab result that you saw? There was, um, the stomach contents were looked at by um, a lab called AIT. But to tell you the truth, I don't think, um, if we're talking about Dr. Lung's findings, I don't think there's anything in there that has anything to do with Dr. Lung's findings. AIT stands for American Institute of Toxicology? Yes. This we marked as an exhibit. Dr. Mainland, after you had an opportunity to look at Aaron Dillard's statement, the one that I just showed to you, and compare that now to the photographs that were obtained at the crime scene and also that were obtained at the autopsy. Do you have an opinion to a reasonable degree of medical certainty as to whether or not the description of the death of the murder of Julie Jensen as provided by Aaron Dillard, as he said it came to him from Mark Jensen, is that consistent or inconsistent with the findings at autopsy in this case? It's consistent. And now earlier in August, before you heard of Aaron Dillard, you'd offered this opinion that um, you couldn't rule out asphyxiation, but that the cause of death was ethylene glycol poisoning, is that correct? I think that was the gist of it. And, um, but the, the finding of uh, ethylene glycol as being the cause of death leaves certain other criteria or certain other physical findings in Dr. Shambliss's autopsy protocol unexplained. Objection leading. Is that, well, is that true or not? It just doesn't think that he's going to. I uh, suggest an answer to the expert witness, the objections of the witness. You asked me what again? I'm sorry. Okay. And maybe I didn't put it as well as I could have, so I'll try, I'll try, I'll give another shot at it here. Um, the the um, opinion that the cause of death in this case is ethylene glycol poisoning, that opinion left certain findings at the autopsy, pretty much unexplained, correct? That's fair to say. And that's not unusual, is it? I mean, no. if, if uh, <coughs> someone is shot in the head and falls on a flight of stairs, they may have a series of antemortem or postmortem injuries resulting from falling down the stairs, but that necessarily wouldn't necessarily be the cause of death. It's the gunshot wound to the head that's the cause of death, right? Correct. Um, so it's not unusual in an autopsy case, uh, or in, 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 at autopsy, to find a variety of minor things, uh, other things that may or may not be contributing to the cause of death. Certainly not. And they're left oftentimes unexplained. Judge, it's the third time he's asked it, and it's the third time it's leading. <laughs> um, uh, oral. Did you answer the question, doctor? Oh, I'll just go on another. I can't remember. He doesn't like the question, I'll go on another question. <laughs> so, um, in this instance, however, would you say it, is it fair to say or not that Aaron Dillard's description of Mark Jensen's confession accounts for some injuries at the autopsy that would otherwise have been unaccounted for? Yes. Doctor, do you know what the um, what the generic uh, term is for Librium? Yes, I do. What is it? 
chlorodiazepoxide. Do you want me to spell that? Well, before the uh, report reporter kills me, you might want to just, does she know how to spell it? Just, she, it's just not her head. It's, I'd say you should probably spell it. C-H-L-O-R-D-I-A-Z-E-P-O-X-I-D-E. <laughs> And um, what is what is Librium, and what does it do? It's um, it's of a class of a class of drugs called benzodiazepines. Um, it's a it, it relaxes you basically. It's um, kind of a they call it a hypnotic, but that that sounds a little strong. Um, it, it's kind of an anti-anxiety or or a drug that can be used to relax people. And there was Librium or Chlorodiax, or whatever that stuff is, in, in Julie Jensen's uh, blood and gastric contents, or not? It was present in her gastric contents. I don't believe it was detected in the blood. And um, were there any other, well, what a, can you tell, tell the jury what paroxetine is? Paroxetine is commonly known as Paxil, P-A-X-I-L. Um, that's an antidepressant. And was the paroxetine found in either gastric contents or the stomach or, or, the, um, or the blood of Julie Jensen? I know it was found in the gastric contents. Um, I can't recall if it was found in the blood. I could look, I know exactly where to look if you want me to. Well, why don't you look to see if it was in the blood? No, I don't see it. Do you know what Ambien is? Yes. What is Ambien? It's, the generic is Zolpidem, Z-O-L-P-I-D-E-M. It's a sleeping pill. And was there any Ambien found on board Julie Jensen, either in the gastric contents or the blood? Yes. Where was it found, do you know? In both places. Thank you, Evan, for the questions. Um, but, yeah, subject to that, the other issue that we're going to take up, should we take that up now, Judge? Or because I did want to go into that with the witness. We're going to take a, a short break. Uh, please uh, don't uh, talk about the case during the break. The switch. Testing for I mean, that's just one of the problems. Is he's already left a misleading impression with Dr. Long. They don't do testing for ethylene glycol. They sent it to the University of Kentucky, and she said that she already looked at those results for ethylene glycol. So I mean, this is just one of the problems to try to keep making that point that they don't. I mean, they don't test for it. They don't do it. Just like the Wisconsin State Laboratory of Hygiene sent it out to St. Louis, because they don't do it. Neither does AIT. So you want Dr. Long, or excuse me, you want Dr. Mainland to say what to the jury? That um, they never tested for the stomach contents, for the presence of ethylene glycol. They tested for other things, but not for the presence of ethylene glycol. You know, there's, there, was much, there was so much made of this thing with Dr. Long. Oh, the, Dr. Long was being pilloried and well, because I, of his reports, and, and the fact is, the basic findings of Dr. Law, which they have the, the, judge the stuff. No, no, no. I'll tell you what. I, I'm not sure that, that when I, when I think about what I perceive to be the defense, uh, I'm not sure that what the the examination which was conducted with Dr. Long did necessarily. Um, Required what you were required what you're trying to do, but beyond that, and I and I understand I could easily be missing something, but uh, I I just don't see the um... then the other, the other thing is you're I was looking for the um, exhibits 208 and 209 which have seem to have disappeared they were um, oh they're right here these are copies oh these are copies of 208 and 209. Are they on top of the projector over there? Well, in 208 and 207. We got copies of them. 
Yeah. Or I, don't have the original. I think I just have the copy too. I thought that's what I was using during. I started to look. I haven't found it. Well, Judge, I, I certainly object to going into these with Dr. Mainly. Um Well, now, first of all, um, let's finish one topic before we get into another one. I, 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 I'm inclined not to allow your question on uh, on uh, what uh, ACI did or what a AIT. AIT. Well, if, if based on counsel's explanation, they don't do testing, uh, they don't test for a thing like all. I would I would withdraw the question anyway. I, okay. I was enough. mistaken on that point. And so we let's... also had Kentucky test it. Pardon me? We did have, as she testified, we had University of Kentucky test it. He said he withdrew the question, so I'm not going to have oh. anything to do with this discussion. Right. Because, well, there's, there's no legal matter. matter for me to decide. If... Um, so then, now we're into the next issue, which was... I think we should. 207 and 208. And I, I don't think Dr. Lincoln is in the courtroom right now, so I can... I was simply going to ask her to look at 207 and 208. I'm going to indicate to her that, assuming for a moment, hypothetically, assuming for a moment, that the ion of interest is the one on the left here, is there any, would you consider it to be fair that this is a fair and accurate representation of the findings? Has she got the credentials for that? She That's reads toxicological reports all the time. She okay. reads these kind of reports all the time. What's your objection? Judge, that is extrinsic evidence. I mean, are we are we going to open up the Stallings this case? Isn't because for impeachment. What? This isn't for impeachment. It's no, it's to rehabilitate Dr. Long. And the the court read the rule and decided that you couldn't do that. Well, what I what I couldn't do, Your Honor, what we I mean, what the court said. Let me think I'm about sorry. it. Let me I'm think sorry. about what he said. I thought you were done. I didn't know you were. I didn't know you were. No. Now, what's your response? Yes. Okay. Um, we're not reopening the Stallings case. This, this witness is not going to be asked to testify about whether Dr. Long got it right or wrong in the Stallings case. All she's going to be asked is, assuming um, for- No, it doesn't make any difference because you're asking about the Stallings case. I'm asking about this exhibit. This exhibit. Which is the Stallings, which is from the Stallings case. Um, if it well, were from an exhibit from this case, I would say ask him anything you want. Yeah, it is an but, exhibit from the Stallings case, and yeah, it was, but it's now an exhibit in this right. case it's as well. Forensic evidence, and you're not going to be allowed. Okay. Well, in that case, Your Honor, I'm done with my direct okay. examination of Dr. Mainland. You ready? Oh, just a couple, two minutes. Go ahead. Um, we, we have two minutes, Judge. I, uh, well, he has two. You have what's ever left of the two. <laughs> well, I guess I better stick right here. Oh, oh gentlemen, I'm going to have you. Yeah. Really? I don't see that. What is it? I gave to her to give me back. And I gave her a copy. And then I don't know what it is. Well, I guess at the very least, we're going to leave the copies with, um, with Tammy, and if the originals show up, at least now you'll have a copy. I will need a break at, at some point. To sort of readjust some things based on some of her testimony that I wasn't anticipating, well, I, but I, I've got plenty to go on for a while. We would have a typical, typically we would have a break at around, uh, at around 3.30. Okay, I so, th think I probably have enough to go there. Okay. If you don't, we can break a little bit of this. Um, yeah? Since we couldn't find the originals, do you want to remark these copies with an original sticker? That's fine with me. No problem. Whatever they agree to. I'm happy to have them agree on something. Um, <laughs> let's, uh, shall we continue? Ask the jurors to come in, please. Please be seated. Could you get uh, what's on my printer, please? <coughs> uh, go ahead, Miss. Uh, the uh, I think that the district had concluded his examination now, and uh, so, Mr. Mulvey. Thank you, Judge. Good afternoon, Dr. Malin. Uh, you testified. Uh, on direct about uh, some of your medical education. As I understand it, you graduated from the Medical College of Wisconsin? 
Correct. When was that? 1995. Wait. Yeah, 1995. I thought this would be the easy, the easy <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'm in for a long afternoon. <laughs> uh, and then after graduating in 1995 is when you did this four years plus one of a residency? Yes. So it was 99, 2000 that you were uh, in the Milwaukee Medical Examiner's Office doing a residency? Yes. Then in, from 2000 until, I'm sorry, you took over the Kenosha County Medical Examiner's Office in January 2005? Yes. So for that, what is it, a five year period that you were after your residency? Yes, um, you, yeah. Okay. You'll ask, so I'll, I'll it, shut what, my mouth. What were you doing during that period? Um, from uh, July of 2000 to July of 2001, I, was, I did a year of forensic pathology training in Virginia. And that's because um, the American Board of Pathology doesn't consider specialized training during your residency to count. So you needed that you needed that year for your certification, right? So, in July two thousand one, what did you begin doing then? Then I was um, hired by the Milwaukee County Medical Examiner's Office as an assistant medical examiner, and I think I started there in August. So you worked for about three and a half years as an assistant medical examiner before you became medical examiner in Kenosha. Yes. You mentioned how uh, the ways in which you conducted your investigation in this case. Did you speak with any witnesses? No. The, I don't think as, so. Okay, as I, understood, as I understood your answer, you said I would talk to others, family, friends, the person's physician, police, and so I wanted to clarify. You didn't, you didn't talk okay. to the, uh, well, you did talk to Detective Ratsburg at some point, true? Yes, you, what, can I clarify what that answer sure. meant? When I say I, I kind of was using the I of, I wasn't using necessarily myself personally. Um, personnel from my office would, you know, I don't usually do all the interviewing is what I'm trying to say, so. Um, Typically, and, and I did talk to Detective Ratzberg, and I forgot about that, but. Okay, well, that's, that's just what I'm trying to do is clarify that. You did not talk to witnesses personally in this case, other than Detective Ratzberg? Not that I remember. Okay, mm -hmm. and, and so you didn't have a, a chance to judge their credibility yourself, right? I wouldn't say that. Well, you, um, what you did is you read some witness statements on paper, correct? Yes. And from your experience doing these kinds of investigations and being at crime scenes, you understand that sometimes when you talk to people in person, they, you may have a different view of their credibility than just reading it on paper, correct? That can be true, sure. And that's why we have people come to court and testify in person, right? I guess among a bunch of other reasons. And they have to take an oath to tell the truth when they're in court too, right? Yes. And that's not required generally when they're giving the statements that you're reading, correct? Not to my knowledge. So for example, Aaron Dillard, you didn't speak with him in person. No. What, what were you told, or what do you know about Aaron Dillard's background? Uh, I've been reading the papers. Um, I know he's uh, quite the con artist. Okay, and before you read the paper, I, you said you read the paper regarding um, whatever the paper had to say about his examination in this courtroom? Yes. Before that time, you hadn't done any investigation to find out whether he was a reliable witness? Before that, um, when I was presented with his statement, um, Mr. Jamboys did represent him as a, a con artist. And you understand that a, a really good con artist 
can figure out ways to present a story that aren't obvious to other people. That's how they con them, right? Sure. Let me talk to you a little bit about <clears throat> ethylene, ethylene glycol. Uh, you testified that uh, the first, from your examination of the case file, the first time that Mrs. Jensen showed signs of intoxication was in the early morning hours of December 2nd, correct? Yes. Do you recall that being uh, around the area of 2 a.m.? That's what was stated. And you have no contrary information, true? Um, no, I don't, unless, um, well, I don't want to say that. Um, if, we, if we're just talking about this one particular incident, no, I have no contrary in information. So her signs of intoxication began around, around 2 a.m. on December 2nd? Yes, as I understand. Okay, and intoxication would fall in what you called the first phase of ethylene glycol poisoning, correct? Yes. That can begin almost immediately after ingestion, correct? Yes. All the way to beginning maybe 12 hours after ingestion. Yes. So it's certainly possible that Julie Jensen ingested ethylene glycol sometime after midnight in the early morning hours of December 2nd, correct? Anything's possible, but I, I don't agree that that's what happened. Well, that would be consistent with showing signs of intoxication at 2 a.m., correct? It could be. It's fair to say that there's, uh, that there's variation in how different people will respond to ethylene glycol? Yes. Same way that people respond differently to alcohol, correct? Yes, I'm not sure, I mean, not in the same degree or, you know, not as commonly. We don't know as much about ethylene glycol, but that's fair. Sure, <clears throat> there's lots and lots of research about how alcohol affects the human body, correct? Yes. There's far less research on ethylene glycol, true? Yes, I, I would say so. I don't know of every paper published on it, but I would imagine so. I mean, we, <clears throat> number one, we can't do any experiments to see how ethylene glycol affects the, the human body, right? Well, that would not be ethical. Right, so we don't have that information like we do with alcohol where people are performing that, that kind of research routinely, correct? That's fair to say. And so in terms of how long ethylene glycol may stay in the body or in the bloodstream, there are variations among individuals, right? Yes. Uh, and there may even be variations among the same individual at different times, correct? Possibly. Depending on what they may have eaten, what else they may have consumed, whether they consumed other drugs, whether they have some other medical problem, all sorts of factors could uh, uh, be taken into account that would affect their absorption and elimination of ethylene glycol. Yes. Is it fair to say that the information we do have about people who have consumed ethylene glycol, oftentimes it is not particularly reliable? I mean, that's, that's a little bit difficult to answer. But, I mean, you've had, you've had cases where someone, for example, you're confident committed suicide with ethylene glycol, right? Yes. And they didn't, in those cases, they didn't leave a note saying how much they drank, right? Not necessarily. Or, and you don't necessarily know how long it how long it how long they were alive after drink after drinking it correct we can often um, if it was a case i was doing i'd be able to at least infer something from the condition of the body when found but yeah oh maybe and maybe i was talking past you, you wouldn't know how long they were alive after drinking the ethylene glycol that is that is you might be able to determine that they probably died at 5 p.m but you, you may not have any idea as to when they drank the ethylene glycol that caused them to expire at 5 p.m. 
right? I may or may, I may or I may not. It depends on the case. But, but these are some of the difficulties in trying to determine how ethylene glycol might affect someone is because oftentimes we don't have reliable information about how much they drank over what time period and how long it was in the system before they died, right? That's fair to say. And in terms of how much ethylene glycol is required, uh, well, is, is what would be considered a fatal dose, the number often used is 100 milliliters is the minimum dose, correct? Um, that's one number that's frequently quoted in the literature. And presumably, well, you are aware that certainly people have consumed 100 milliliters or more without medical intervention and lived, right? You know, I, I um, testified to that this summer, and I went back and checked, and I really, I think I could have been mistaken about that. Well, you're, you're telling me there's never been such a case? I don't know. What's the most ethylene glycol anybody's ever consumed and lived? Injection relevance is it with or without medical intervention. Well, that's, that's a fair that clarification. It's irrelevant. Go ahead. Uh, but I'll, I'll adopt Mr. Jamboy's suggestion without medical intervention. I don't know. How about with medical intervention? Quartz and quartz. <clears throat> and they've been able to live so long as there's medical intervention. Yes. But you don't know what that maximum, maximum amount would be um, without medical intervention. No, I don't. The, after someone consumes ethylene glycol, it gets absorbed into the blood, correct? Yes. And you would expect somebody typically to reach a peak blood level in approximately one to four hours after they consumed the ethylene glycol, true? That's another um, number that's frequently quoted, yes. And you've, you've seen cases in which it's been longer than, than four hours, correct? I'm aware of such cases. That is, that somebody had their highest blood concentration more than four hours after consuming, <coughs> correct? Yes. And in terms of elimination of uh, ethylene glycol from the blood, the usual half-life that's quoted in the literature is three to five hours, true? I would say that's fair, without, um, without dialysis or intervention. Without any medical intervention, yes. three to five hours. And what half-life half means is, that, is the, the time period it takes to eliminate half of your concentration of ethylene glycol from the blood. Is that accurate? That's, yes. So if, you're, if, your, level, if your level was um, 500, milligrams of uh, per milliliter of ethylene glycol in the blood. In three to five hours, you'd expect that to be 250. And then in another three to five hours, you'd expect it to be 125. Is that yes, right? Yes, within a ballpark, yes. And, and at a five hour half-life, uh, what would it be about 35 hours before you'd expect ethylene glycol to be entirely eliminated from the system? How much, and what was the blood level again? Well, <clears throat> you tell me. So it depends, depends, first of all, what the initial blood level is, right? Yes. And what about if it's a, um, what ultimately could be a fatal dose? If it's a fatal dose, it's often not entirely eliminated. Well, let's, 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 assume, let's assume that they live for, 36 hours. Can they still have ethylene glycol in the blood? You could. Um. So, assuming if Julie Jensen consumed ethylene glycol around midnight on December 1st, December 2nd, the, early, the very early morning of December 2nd, and she didn't reach her peak concentration for up to four hours, 
So we should begin the elimination phase at about 4 a.m. 36 hours later, which would be 4 p.m. on December 3rd, she will have ethylene glycol in her blood, correct? Yes, but that's, um, that's an, I'm only gonna say yes for this isolated assumption because again, I don't believe that's what happened. Well, <coughs> having, she has a very small amount of ethylene glycol in her blood when she passes away, correct? Um, relatively speaking, yes. And that would be consistent with consumption of a relatively large dose around, well, let me, let me back up. What is her time of death? I'd have to check the autopsy report again. I think she was found around 4.30 in the afternoon. I, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I believe that's consistent with the testimony we've, we've had in terms of when she was found, but I'm asking when she passed away. Well, judging from um, what was in what was described in the autopsy protocol and um, <coughs> the observations at the scene, I think she had probably been dead for I want to say several hours. Two to three hours. That's a good range. So we'd have, a, we'd have a time of death maybe between 1.30 and 2.30? That's fair to say. And if she drank ethylene glycol at, for example, midnight on uh, December 2nd, I've never understood if midnight is the, goes to the day before, the, yeah, the day after. I know I, what you I mean. Uh -huh. Okay. First, second, midnight. Mm -hmm. We'd be somewhere in the neighborhood of, of 37, 38 hours later that she passed away. Let me do the math here. Thirty-eight or so. Okay. And given the five hour half life of ethylene glycol that's been quoted, three to five hour half life, if we were if it was a five hour half life uh, and the time it would take to absorb, she could have ethylene glycol still in her bloodstream uh, as of the time of death from a single consumption at midnight on December 2nd. Correct? Assuming that she had survived that single conception for that period of time. Sure. Does and that make sense? Well, I don't think you, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> I can ask you questions. You might even be able to ask me some. We can't, I, I can't, we can't ask, ask the jurors. No. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's right. I'm just trying to be clear. Um, <laughs> but you're aware, certainly, that people consume large amounts of ethylene glycol and live for more than 36 hours, right? I'm not aware of any cases where they live that long without well, okay, what was your question again? I'm gonna, sure. I, wanna, I wanna be precise about this. You're aware of cases where someone's consumed ethylene glycol in an amount that makes them very sick and they've, or ultimately proves fatal, and they've lived longer than 36 hours before either dying or improving, right? Well, I, I'm sorry to interrupt, but I think to have any value in light of what the doctor has already said, you need to attach some quantity I, I don't believe you can, but. Well, the, well, you correct me if I'm wrong, doctor. I was gonna go there anyway. I mean, but how, okay, can you distinguish how somebody would, would uh, metabolize 50 milliliters of ethylene glycol versus 75 versus 100 versus 125? Can you, are you able to make that kind of differentiation? The more you take, the more you consume, the um, more deleterious the effects are gonna be on you, even considering individual variation. So the more you consume without medical attention, the more likely you are to die and the more quickly you are likely to die. 
Sure. So what's the most that you could drink and live 36 hours in your estimation? I can't answer that. Which is the problem with trying to assign a particular, a particular number. I mean, could it, can, you live, can you live after drinking 200 milliliters? Can you live for 48 hours? If you're Andre the Giant, maybe. I mean, are, are you aware of any, any studies that show one way or another? There aren't studies um, because the cases in the literature are mostly um, either autopsy reports or um, cases where there's been med medical in intervention. So no, I'm not aware of a study that shows that someone drank 200 milliliters of ethylene glycol and survived 48 hours. And you, you don't know how much Julie Jensen consumed, right? No, I don't. Not to the, not to the milliliter. Yeah. And, well, can you tell me within 10 milliliters? No. Can you tell me within 50 milliliters? Not with 100, not with um, great certainty, but we can go into that later if you like. Okay. You can't tell us how much she can, let's say if she, well, now let me, let me do this a different way. The third stage, well, let me start with the second stage. The second stage begins, according to most of the literature, 12 to 24 hours after ingestion of ethylene glycol, correct? Yes. Not 12 to 14 hours? Actually, that number is in print. Well, the 12 to 14 hours is how long after the first, after the first stage begins that the second stage begins, right? Isn't that the 12 to 14 hours? No, I understood it. Um, I understood that to be 12 to 14 hours after ingestion, and I'm not quite sure why that one reference um, puts it that way. I, I, I'm, I'm not sure that that's not a type, typographical error in the reference, because I've only seen that in one reference. 12 to 24 hours seems to be the standard that people go by. Yes. And then the third stage, the literature says begins 24 to 72 hours afterwards, right? Yes. Well, if people always passed away before 36 hour point, we wouldn't be talking about up to 72 hours, correct? If people always passed away. When the literature says that the third stage begins 24 to 72 hours afterwards, that must mean that people have lived up into that 72 hour area before demonstrating the third stage of ethylene glycol. Yes. Right, so they can consume ethylene glycol and live to that 36 hour stage, right? I would say that probably they had medical intervention. But well, yes. Well, those three stages, those, are with, those stages are without medical intervention, aren't they? No, I don't believe so. Well, what source, what source can, we, can we go to to tell us that the 24 to 72 hours is the with medical intervention? I don't have... The only way I can... Well... We, as we were discussing, most of the um, studies in the literature are on people that have... Um, had med medical intervention. And the onset of the phases um, is not, I mean, the, a certain number of hours are described for these various phases, but it's not um, set in stone. The more you consume, the more likely it is that the phases might be accelerated. You can exhibit some. You can exhibit multiple multiple phases at once. You can um, have phases that aren't clinically apparent. So I don't even know if I answered your question. Well, 
as you just said, these phases aren't necessarily distinct, right? Right. They don't necessarily begin right within these, these concrete time periods that are cited in the literature, true? True. And we do have literature that says they can begin 20, the third stage can begin 24 to 72 hours after ingestion, right? Yes. And that's because people may be living into that third time period and not show those symptoms of the third phase until as late as 72 hours. Yes. And that's without medical intervention. I don't know that. Well, the point of the medical intervention would be to prevent the third phase from ever arising, for example, right? The f third phase often um, is, <coughs> is apparent when people receive medical attention because the people that receive medical attention for ethylene glycol poisoning typically have taken a large or a significant amount of it. So. I guess we're going to be talking in circles here. Well, you can't identify any source that would tell me that the third phase of 72 hours would only apply to people who has medical intervention, right? I can't point to a source that says that, no. And it would be fair to say that someone could not demonstrate symptoms of the third phase until 30 to 36 hours, would that be reasonable, after ingestion? Could you repeat that, please? Sure. It would be fair to say that someone who ingested ethylene glycol may not demonstrate symptoms of the third phase until 30 to 36 hours after ingestion. Yes, it would be fair to say that. And so Julie Jensen could have consumed a dose on her own around midnight on December 2nd. She would demonstrate intoxication early that morning and then be sick and still at the time of death, 36 hours, 37, 38 hours later, have ethylene glycol in her blood, right? I don't think so. Well, that would be consistent with the time of, uh, to reach the peak level and the half-lives for ethylene glycol, true? Again, we need to talk about specific amounts. If Julie Jensen took a large suicidal dose, she probably would not have survived that long. Well, so, you know, you have to tell me. Uh, how about you tell me what a large dose is? A large dose is um, a dose that can kill you. Um, it depends on it depends on the size of the person. Um, it depends on a lot of things. In my in my view, a large dose is um, you know fatal or near fatal amount. And you can take a fatal, or you can take certainly a near fatal amount of ethylene glycol and live for several days, right? If it's near fatal, you live for the rest of your life, I guess, beyond that. I guess that would be the definition of yeah. near fatal, wouldn't That's it? That's right. You can, you, can have, you can take what ultimately proves to be a fatal dose and live without medical intervention for several days, true? What ultimately proves to be a fatal dose? Yes. I'm not aware of any really well-documented cases of that. Well, how many different cases have you looked at closely? Closely, probably about 15. In the literature, you know, um, not, maybe not quite as closely, but um, I've certainly, you know, looked at them dozens more. Well, and what's the most ethylene glycol anybody consumed without medical intervention and lived in any of those cases? We don't know. And again, it depends on the person and the amount. It depends on the person. Well, I'm just asking what the literature shows in terms of what any one person, how long they lived. Without medical intervention? Right. It depends on the dose. Well, I'm not asking about the, the dose. I'm asking about 
any person in any of these case studies, what's the longest that they lived after consuming ethylene glycol and then they ultimately died? Um. I can think of some that survived days and days, but those are the ones that made it to the hospital. And how long did it take them to get to the hospital? Hours. So is the answer you don't know? The what question? Thank you. So the last question of what is the longest that someone has lived without medical intervention after consuming ethylene glycol when they ultimately died from that? I don't know. Now you're aware of at least one case in which a person still had ethylene glycol in their stomach 28 hours after arriving at the hospital, right? Yes. And in that case, it appeared that they had drank the ethylene glycol several hours before they got to the hospital, true? Yes. And in that case, the person ultimately went into a coma, correct? Yes. But their ethylene glycol appeared to have been in their stomach for at least 30 hours, true? That's fair to say. Another potential explanation for ethylene glycol being in the stomach in this particular case might have been if Mrs. Jensen drank water later on out of the same glass that she drank ethylene glycol out of, correct? I'm not so sure about that. Well, you're aware that she only had about a half a teaspoon of ethylene glycol in her stomach, true? Yes. And if that amount was consumed within a few hours of death, a half a teaspoon, that would, could be the amount that was left in her stomach, true? Within a few hours of death? Yes. I would expect some of it to be absorbed. So, <clears throat> but that, that might depend on what her gastric emptying time is, right? Partially. She had a distended stomach at the time of death, right? Yes. And tell us what a distended stomach means. Stretched out and big. I'm stretched out and? Big and full. I'm sorry, I still couldn't understand that word. Stretched out big and full. Big. Ah, OK. That's a doctor word. <laughs> <laughs> and when someone has a distended stomach, that may be that there's a, there, there are some delays in gastric emptying, right? Stomach emptying? It may be. The, when's the last time you think that Julie Jensen would have been able to eat? I doubt that she would have been able to eat on the day of her death. Um, she may have been able to eat the day before her death. And how long does it take a stomach to empty generally? It, again, it depends on what's in it. Do you have a range? Liquids, you know, um, an hour or so, solids, hours. And how do you explain the potato and pepper in Julie Jensen's stomach? Well, first of all, I'm not really positive that they were potato and pepper. You didn't look at those gastric contents, right? Right. Dr. Shambliss did, correct? Yes. You're relying on Dr. Shambliss's report in this case, correct? I am. Dr. Shambliss identified potato and pepper in the gastric contents. He identified what he perceived to be potato and pepper in small amounts. And that's, that's what he said, is that it's potato and pepper, right? Yes. Dr. Mainlin, when you started when you started with the Kenosha County Medical Examiner, 
Mr. Jamboise came to you and said that you'd be working on this case, right? He said I'd probably get involved with it. And I, I think what you acknowledged on direct is that he told you uh, that it was a homicide case, correct? I don't know exactly what he told me. He, he may have told me it was a homicide, but he asked me to um, look it over and determine or see what I thought the cause and manner of death were. I don't, I don't remember the exact words he used. He made it pretty clear what, what his position was on that, right? Yes. You knew that it was a pending case, right? Pending in the courts. Yes. yes. It had already been charged, let's put it that way. Yes. The, uh, the first medical examiner on this case was Dr. Shambliss, correct? Well, he was um, the forensic pathologist that did the autopsy. The medical examiner at the time was Dr. Levin. The doctor, Dr. Shambliss was the first person to do work on this case, true? Yes. And he never, he never filed any autopsy report with a cause of death, true? Not to my knowledge. And you've reviewed all the files in your office and there is no such report, correct? I, if, if there is, I haven't seen it. Dr. Dr. Maureen Lavin then took over uh, the case, right? Yes. And she's the one who wrote an autopsy report in this case identifying Cause of death is ethylene glycol, true? She um, didn't rewrite the whole autopsy report. She made an addendum, yes. And she's the only person in your office that's ever written, written a report regarding cause of death, correct? Yes. You've never written any report in this case? No, I wasn't asked to. When you began as, as medical examiner in January 2005, you were aware that Dr. Lavin had been fired? Yes, that's why I was hired. And you were aware that Dr. Lavin had been fired regarding a dispute with Mr. Jamboys about this case? Um, I can't tell you the whole circumstances of her firing. I know that there was some issue, and it did occur over this case. But I don't know if that was the whole deal. I, you know, I, it's none of my business, really. But you understood that to be a, a reason here, correct? That's fair to say. You were happy to get this new position? Yes, I was. And uh, certainly didn't want to get crosswise with Mr. Jamboys in this homicide case that was pending. Um. Actually, I have no reason to get crosswise with him or any other attorney. And you, knew, you knew what he was looking for in terms of an opinion in this case, true? Well, I was hoping he was asking me for my independent opinion, um, which I would consider to be the truth. And in formulating your opinions in this case, one thing you did was you reviewed Dr. Lavin's preliminary hearing testimony. I did. You also were aware as of the time you came on board that uh, Dr. Long had issued a toxicology report in this matter, correct? At, at the time I came on board with this case? Yes. Yeah, yes. Thank you for the clarification. And Mr. Jamboys, when he first told you about this case, told you that Dr. Long had made a mistake on this matter, correct? He said, Again, it's, it, it goes back a few years. He said a mistake was made. Um, it was, I think he said a mistake was made. It was caught by the defense. But I, I really couldn't tell you if he said Dr. Long made the mistake. Well, and you spoke with Dr. Long himself at some point, correct? Yes. Do you recall when that was? I know I spoke to him in 2006 about the case. I have notes on that. Do you recall speaking with him after that point? I've spoken to him, yes. In preparation for this trial, you've spoken with him? That and on other unrelated cases. Oh, okay. And, and, and with other cases that he's done for your office? Yes. And Dr. Long 
also told you that he had made an unfortunate mistake in his report in this case, right? I don't know that he admitted it was his mistake, honestly. Um, he said there was, I, I think I'm the one that brought up the word mistake. And um, shoot, I didn't tape record the conversation. I can't remember exactly what was said, but um, I said, I think I asked him for a clean report because there had been a mistake made. And, and he said, you know, yes, I'm like, yes, that was unfortunate. I don't know who, I don't know if, who made the mistake. I really don't. Well, this, this, re this report of Dr. Long's was a mistake because it said there was a large amount in the gastric contents when there was not, correct? A large amount of ethylene glycol in the gastric contents? The number was large. The, that was the problem with the report, right? Is that the large amount in the gastric contents. I guess that was the problem. Um, I mean, maybe it was the problem with the interpretation because you know, I'm familiar with the report, and um, if you look at the number, that's um, that you know the, the amount of ethylene glycol in the stomach. If you look at just the number, it looks very large. Well, that is, if you if you look at it as three thousand nine hundred forty micrograms, it looks large. Right. But if you do the math, and it's only two point six grams, then it's not so large. Relatively speaking. And that was, that was Dr. Long's report and Dr. Long's report alone, correct? Um, I think he did use the word large in, you know, you gotta, now I've got to ask you which report you're referring to. Um, are you referring to just the toxicology report itself or, uh, or the... Um, report he issued later? His three-page narrative report of March 11th, 2002. Okay, I think he did use the word large in that report. And you saw the defense reports from Dr. Denton and Dr. Rumack exposing that error, correct? Yes. Those are in your file, correct? Yes. And you're familiar with Dr. Denton? Yes, I am. Dr. Denton sometimes does contract work for you? Um, he has in the past. And when you talk to Dr. Long, I mean, he wasn't saying someone else made a mistake, was he? He, no, he didn't blame it on anyone. Well, do you recall giving the following testimony, page 132, uh, line, beginning of line 17 on August 1st, 2007. Question, did you talk to Dr. Long about that mistake? Answer, I did. And what did he say? Answer, he felt that it was an unfortunate mistake. Yes. And that is what Dr. Long had to say. Yes. What was that patient's name? Uh, it was 132, I believe, that I just read from. And when you read that statement, you had the presumption that it meant that there was a stomach full of ethylene glycol. True? That's how you interpreted it? No, I already knew that that wasn't the case. So I guess, I guess it wasn't fair because I already knew that wasn't the case. Well, you knew the fact of the matter was that it wasn't a stomach full, but in terms of what the original report was conveying, you understood that to be a presumption of nearly a stomach full, right? I don't think so. Not necessarily. Do you recall giving the following testimony, page 152, line 14, you were asked the following question. Let's go to opinion number three of Dr. Long as to why this is a homicide. Ms. Jensen would have been too weak to drink the volume of ethylene glycol in her stomach at autopsy without help. Do you agree with that statement? Answer, I think we both know that this this statement was written under a presumption that she had a stomach full of ethylene glycol, and I would agree with that. The court, you would agree with what? Witness, 
you, Dr. Mainland, that she could not have drank a stomach full of ethylene glycol on the day of her death without help. Right, and I still don't, um, yeah. Um, <laughs> now I forget what your question was. Yeah, well, I, I don't believe she could have drunk a stomach full of ethylene glycol with, without help, but um, I think. And what you, said, what you said there was that I think we both know that this statement was written under a presumption that she had a stomach full of ethylene glycol. And that was Dr. Long's presumption, right? It, it may or may not have been. I could be wrong about that. It and certainly in, isn't mine. And in, and in Dr. Long, I mean, Dr. Lavin's preliminary hearing testimony, that was the conclusion she reached as well, true? Yes, Dr. Lavin did testify to that. There were 55 micrograms per milliliter of ethylene glycol in Julie Jensen's blood at the time of death? Yes. You're aware that the literature, or there is some literature that suggests that uh, a lethal amount in the blood would be, the minimum would be something more like 300 micrograms, correct? I know exactly the source that you're referring to, and let's double check and see if I'm right. Is it Basalt? I, I think that's one of them, sure. Okay. Um, the, um, the range you just gave, I believe, comes from a book called Disposition of, oh shoot, now I forget the title, um, Drugs and Toxic Chemicals in Man or something like that. And it's a reference book that, um, you know, that forensic pathologists uh, refer to frequently. And in the um, section on ethylene glycol, Basalt does describe a series of nine cases in which that was the range. Nine cases of fatalities with ethylene glycol in which that was the range reported. But you, is it fair to say that you don't believe that someone has to have at least 300 micrograms in their blood in order to pass away from ethylene glycol? I know they don't. So we had some testimony from Dr. Shambliss uh, earlier in this trial to the effect that that would be the minimum lethal amount. You would disagree with that? Dr. Shambliss said 300 that is the minimum lethal amount? I don't recall if that, if he may have uh, modified that, but he was using a range such as that from basalt. I don't agree with that. In, in fact, you could pass away from ethylene glycol uh, with none, none left in your blood, fair to say? Or at least none to, yes, yes. And more predictive of the effect that uh, someone would currently be suffering from ethylene glycol would be the level of the metabolites? Yes. And you could also look at uh, electrolyte levels? Um, they can be helpful sometimes. I mean, one of the things that you look at in stage three is there's a concern about uh, kidney damage, correct? Yes, late in stage three is um, when kidney damage is typically described. And ultimately kidney failure. Yes. That could cause death. Yes. It was your opinion that Julie Jensen had to be acidotic? I know she was acidotic. And how do you know she was acidotic? Well, I knew she was acidotic, number one, from her symptoms, but number two, from um, some toxicology that was done at the University of Kentucky. Well, are you relying on the glycolic acid levels? Yes, that certainly tells me she was acidotic. I, I mean, I, I believed that before I saw those numbers, but they support my opinion. Did you look at her bicarbonate level, for example? Yes, I did. And her bicarbonate level would suggest that her kidneys were still 
functioning, correct? Well, the problem is the electrolytes that we were looking at were not from the blood because blood electrolytes after death are notoriously unreliable. They were from the vitreous humor. And um, it takes a while for what's going on in the, in the blood to equilibrate with what's going on in the vitreous humor. And furthermore, I know of cases of ethylene glycol poisoning that people died and their vitreous electrolytes were within normal limits. But you could die from, you can die from other causes than the kidney failure, correct? Yes. And those electrolyte levels are, are more of a telltale sign as to the level of functioning of the kidneys, correct? They can be, you know, it has not, vitreous electrolytes, that particular topic has not been studied all that well. Um, um, vitreous electrolytes and ethylene glycol poisoning. But I mean, certainly the vitreous electrolytes can reflect what's going on in the kidneys. Um, but uh, yeah, that's, I'm done. Okay. That is, you could not look at the kidneys themselves in autopsy and determine whether they are functioning or not, generally speaking. Um, Generally speaking, um, well, f failing kidneys, I mean, really badly failing kidneys can look different than normal kidneys, but not necessarily. <clears throat> Dr. Mainland, is it your opinion that Julie Jensen would not have been able to use the telephone on the morning of December 2nd? Um, I know where you're going with this, um, and I know she was able to, so uh, I guess I can't make an opinion anymore because I know she was able to. Well, you testified at the last hearing that you doubted she'd be able to use a telephone on the morning of December 2nd. Is that yes. right? Yes, I did. I, I said I doubted it, and I was mistaken because um, she did. Page 171, line 17. And just the question was, would she have been able to use the telephone on the morning of December 2nd? Answer, I doubt it. Right? I remember saying that, yes. You are aware that she had a telephone conversation on the morning of December 2nd with Mrs. Voigt. Yes. Similarly, you indicated in your testimony she, that you doubted she'd be able to use the telephone on the evening of December 2nd, on the morning of December 3rd, right? Yes. And you doubted that she'd uh, been able to eat on the morning of December 2nd, right? Did I say that? I don't remember. Um, page 171, line 7, would she have been able to eat on the morning of December 2nd? Answer, again, I doubt it. She may, she may have tried. Fair. So <clears throat> were you wrong in your answers then? I was mistaken in the answer about the telephone. And about being able to eat, presumably? Um, not necessarily. She had a coherent she telephone, did. she had a coherent telephone conversation in the morning of December 2nd, is what your review of the files has demonstrated, correct? I'm not sure how um, coherent it was, but she had a telephone conversation. Well, <clears throat> from your review of the files, you understood that her neighbor was able to understand what she was saying to her, correct? Yes. And that Julie Jensen gave her instructions about not worrying if she didn't see her outside, correct? That was the testimony of the neighbor, yes. And that she said, I don't need any, essentially, I don't need any help from you this morning, correct? I think she did refuse offers of help, if I'm not mistaken. She said her husband was taking care of her. So presumably you also could be mistaken about her ability to do certain tasks on December 3rd, for example, true? 
I don't think so. But you didn't think you were mistaken at the last hearing either when you testified that she couldn't use the telephone on December 2nd, right? Objection argumentative. Sustained. Well. Actually, I knew I'd made that error um, pretty quickly after it came out of my mouth. Do you have any basis for saying she could not eat on the morning of December 2nd? She was, she was rather ill. Um, I, I'm just saying that she could have tried to eat, but I'm not saying that, you know, I'm not saying that she like couldn't have tried to eat anything. I'm, I'm saying that I doubt that she wolfed down a big meal. Well, she wasn't too ill to have a telephone conversation with her neighbor, right? Objection, counsel's arguing with the witness. Well, I think it's fair cross-examination. Oral. Right? Right. And there has to be some explanation for the potato and pepper in her gastric contents, right? Number one, if they are potato and pepper. And and certainly, yes. Well I'll just leave that for uh, <clears throat> the amount of urine that Julie Jensen had at the time of her death in her body was a typical amount. I would say so. You had information that she was drinking a lot of water? Um, yes, I believe that was, um, yes. Let's make it short, yes. You weren't aware of any uh, bodily fluids whatsoever being found in the bed, right? Uh, there was a little spot of something on the sheet, I think, in one of the scene photos that nobody ever identified, right? Not to my knowledge. That nobody ever tried to identify, right? Uh, not to my knowledge. That nobody ever tried to date, correct? Not to my knowledge. I mean, from that photograph, there's just a tiny, a tiny little spot that, from all you can tell from that photograph, may have been a year old. <laughs> I think she was a better housekeeper than that. <laughs> well, some spots don't come out, isn't that true? <laughs> yeah. Was there anything in the, was there any other fluid than one unidentified spot that nobody tried to identify in the bed? At, at the time of the, um, at the time the death scene was investigated, it wasn't described. That's the, the best I can say, not to my knowledge. Nobody described any vomit in the bed, right? No. Nobody described any urine or feces in the bed, right? No. Nobody described any urine or feces in her clothes, right? I don't recall so. I could check the autopsy report and be 100% certain. If you'd feel more comfortable doing that, sure. All right, just give me a second. Let's uh, take a break, uh, uh, 10 minutes. Uh, please don't talk about the case. Please all rise.